this is the lecture that we are going to take today. So this is also a PDF file, but this is not that convenient to print because this is by way of presentation. So there are things like this. Now you are most welcome to make use of these as well. Okay. So this is essentially a lecture through projections, but also the same material is available as logic notes. So these are notes on the same. Every diagram that you see in projections is here. But the text is a little detailed, which is appropriate, so it reads like a book. Okay, so the same is found here. Okay, with the table of contents and as as much as you would find in a book, and it is the same same material that you are going to see here. So the idea is that this thing can be distributed to students so that they can print out and it's more convenient to read as a book. On the other hand, the other material is more convenient to use as projection material. So, uh, almost all the material is available in both these forms uh, separately and it will be there on your CD uh, when you leave. So, you are free to use it in uh, any way that you wish. So, we will begin with a essentially a transistor model. We are going to use uh, MOS transistor and we need to model this uh, so that uh, uh, we can design things with it. Okay. So, generally this is the course on VLSI design that we uh, teach and this is the proper place to begin because what I find is that many students uh, are not that confident with MOS devices. They have done bipolar devices and so on. These days it is becoming a little better, but uh, I do include a transparency or two about uh, how MOS devices operate. This is not a device physicist's view, it is a designer's view of uh, an MOS device. So, you would notice here that uh, what we have are extremely simple textbook like equations here that uh, uh, we assume a hard turn on, we assume no leakage here. So, th therefore, if the gate voltage, gate source voltage is less than the threshold voltage, then we assume that the current is 0. If it is greater than Vt and on the other hand, the drain source voltage is less than the saturation voltage, then we have this linear equation. And if the gate voltage is greater than Vt and Vds is greater than the saturation voltage, then we have the saturation uh, equation where the current is independent of the drain voltage. For digital design, this is quite okay. We will see later when we do op amp design and so on that this leads to uh, very uh, positive results. You seem to get very high gains and so on, which you will actually not realize in real life. But uh, for digital design, this is okay as a beginning. And of course, once you have done the, um, the basic design, then you have to go, go to simulation and see that uh, the circuit works with a very detailed model. This is just a paper model. So, this model is oversimplified in the sense that it assumes, for example, that this current is, uh, you know, just uh, concentrate on this uh, equation. Uh, I am afraid my loyalties are split here uh, for this. Ideally, in class, I would want you to point there. Uh, but uh, right now, because it is being recorded, I am going to use this uh, pointer as far as possible. Uh, so, this is uh, the equation that is a bit unsatisfactory. It says that the current is totally independent of the drain voltage in this regime. And that is shown by, actually this is not quite uh, showing the saturation, but essentially according to this equation, the current will become totally flat at that particular point. A realistic model actually... Uh, uses slightly more complicated equations. Okay? And the reason for that is the following. Let us look at those two simple equations. Now, this is the equation in the linear regime. Okay? Now, if I take its derivative, what will I get? I will get Vgs minus Vt, I am taking the derivative with respect to Vds. So, this term will just be Vgs minus Vt. Right? And here, I will get just Vds. Right? Half Vds squared. So, I will get Vds. So, overall, I get Vgs minus Vt minus Vds. Okay? When I take this derivative. So, therefore, if Vgs, if Vds is Vg minus Vt, then this will just cancel this. Okay? So, as a result, this slope becomes 0. That we see graphically. 
what it says is that this line is horizontal. Okay. Now the point is that as I come from the left, that is the equation that we are looking at. This is the this is the equation for low VDS. So as I come from the left, at the terminal point, the curve is already horizontal, and it runs into another curve which is horizontal. So there is no problem in this case. However, that is a physical approximation. In reality, we know that current continues to increase. So in that case, how am I to merge these two equations? If I keep the saturation voltage the same, then the first equation says that the current will become independent of VDS, right? So it will go and become horizontal. And then I say it does not saturate. So you will have an equation which will go and uh, saturate and then take off at an angle. So you will have a discontinuity. So to take, to get rid of that uh, discontinuity, you have these equations. So essentially, you assume that there is an early voltage, very much like a bipolar transistor. This is an approximation by the way for MOS, not really true. So if you produce all these lines, they will go and meet on the negative side at some point, which is the early voltage. Okay? And which shows that all these lines have a positive slope and the slope increases as the current increases. Okay? Now, because it does not culminate in a horizontal line, your matching should be such that the last point on this part of the curve should not be horizontal. It should have the same slope as the line that it is going to continue as. Otherwise, it will be it will have a kink. right? So, it is that which leads to this complicated uh, set of equations, not actually very complicated. Notice that this is the same equation. This is also the same equation. Right? This is the same equation except that the IDSS is defined that is the saturation current is defined by the same equation as last time and now there is a linear increase in this VD plus V upon VDSS plus V. So, it is linearly dependent on VD and that is what describes this equation. Okay? Now, I am doing this because this discussion will do double purpose. It is really required for analog design in which this lack of saturation is crucial. But for digital design, most of the time, we can use the simpler model that we had seen earlier. Okay? All right. So now we know our CMOS uh, device uh, or at least uh, an NBOS device there. We can begin with the proper design. So let us, there are various design styles for designing logic. And the first of these is the most common. This is the CMOS static design style. Uh, this is what uh, is dealt with in great detail in books and perhaps most of you are familiar with it. Okay? So, I am going to spend comparatively less time on it even though this is the dominant style of logic. But this is well explained in books and I expect all of you to be reasonably familiar with it. Uh, with it. However, there are certain things which are not done in the books and those are the ones that I am going to concentrate on in the lecture here. Okay? So, if you have a logic, then it should be capable of going to either 0 or 1. That makes, meaning that does not need any elaboration. So, each logic stage contains a pull up and pull down networks which are controlled by signals. Okay? Now, the pull up network contains p channel transistors in CMOS. So, these are the ones p channel transistors take the no output node towards VDD. The pull down network is made of n channel transistors and we have to ensure that both of these do not turn on at the same time nor is it possible for them to be off at the same time. So, as a result, the output is definitely connected either to ground or to VDD, but never to both and never to neither. So, there is a definite continuous drive. Okay? This rule you will see later will be violated by dynamic circuits which charge a node and then just disconnect. Okay? However, for CMOS logic, it is continuously driven and no power is wasted statically. And that can be assured only if the pull up and the pull down are never on simultaneously. Okay? So, let us take the simplest of these structures which is the inverter. Now, the inverter design is very important. Most, you know, you would see in books that there is so much discussion about the inverter and the question which should naturally come to your students and if it does not come, you should encourage this question from students is why is the inverter so important? 
most of the time we don't use inverters we use logic gates nands nors and so on so why should we study an inverter in such uh, detail okay so what is your take on this why is the inverter important it is the basic building block but in fact it is not the basic building you might say that digital digital design you give me a nand and i can design anything with it but you can't design everything with a with an inverter so uh, it is not a basic building block of design it's a build, basic building block of something else what it does is that it represents any logic level logic not necessarily inverter what happens is that it has a pull up this p channel transistor and it has a pull down this n channel transistor and the condition for pulling up and pulling down can be made more complicated that will automatically lead to other kinds of design so once you have optimized the inverter design then we can develop thumb rules which will convert this inverter design to any other design so therefore this is the inverter is the generator for other kinds of design once you have design optimized the inverter design then you can generate by scaling laws or simple thumb rules other kinds of design that is why we spend so much time on designing inverters now if you look at the inverter characteristics you would notice that there are many parts of this which are uh, important this is the region in which the uh, output is high this is the region in which the output is low and in this region the output is digitally undefined okay now we have to study all of these uh, regimes now notice that we have now defined four quantities here there is the input low there is the input high there is the output low and there is the output high okay now the question is that these are defined by these two coordinate points here the xy coordinate of this and the xy coordinate of this they define they, they define these four quantities so how do i choose these points why is this point here and not here not here not here right why is this point here okay so let's make it into a discussion otherwise you'll fall asleep so if we define this output low input high input low etc by these points how do we choose this point because later when we determine the noise margin these are these are the things which are not discussed in textbook so much that's why i'm raising these later i'm just going to skip over most of the algebra saying you are going to get the notes anyway but these concepts are important and these must be students must be made aware of these uh, concepts so let us now look at the basic differential between logic design and analog design so the answer is so the so so the suggestion is that in analog we are worried about the actual value of the voltage which is which must be amplified whereas in logic levels we are only interested in whether it is a zero or one okay and that of course is the difference but let us go a step further from there what it means is that as long as input is zero we don't care whether it is zero volts or 0.2 volts or 0.3 volts or 0.4 volts as long as it is one we don't care whether it is 4.5 volts or 3.8 volts or whatever right therefore my output should be insensitive to the actual level of the voltage right output should not worry whether if it is a digital circuit my output should not worry whether the input is 3.8 volts or 4.2 volts or 4.5 volts a one is a one and it should give me more or less the same output irrespective of what the detailed voltage level is for a digital circuit on the other hand the analog circuit should be faithful to the input voltage it should not ignore the input voltage right so that follows okay and we, we are going to pick it up later in tomorrow's uh, uh, talk when we do the uh, analog design so where is the curve insensitive to the exact input voltage where it is horizontal 
because the differential of the output voltage with respect to input voltage is 0 there and where is it horizontal? It is horizontal here and it is horizontal here and that is precisely the region in which we define a 0 or a 1 the digital mode of operation. Where is it faithful to the input? Where it is linear? This is the region, this is the linear region. Okay? So, the question is where do I delineate the digital region from the analog region? Okay? So, we define this quantity dv0 by dvi, okay? the voltage, the differential, the slope of the output voltage with respect to the input voltage. Okay? Now, for digital operation, this slope should be low, ideally 0. For analog operation, this slope should be high. Right? So, therefore, the same circuit is now acting as a digital circuit or an analog circuit. So, where is the uh, separation? The separation is the point where the gain is 1. If the gain is less than 1, that means any differences at the input are diminished at the output. That is what we mean by noise level. Right? You may give it a very poor 0 and the output. So, it is very important that noise must be diminished and not amplified and therefore, the gain which is dv0 by dvi should be less than 1. Okay? So, now we have got the formula. We draw tangents on this curve and pick out those two points where the slope is minus 1. This is an inverter. So, the slope is always going to be negative. As the input increases, the output will decrease. But when the magnitude is 1, that is a 45 degree tan theta is 1. Right? So, we draw those two points where the tangent is at 45 degrees. Right? Now, everything to the left of this is more horizontal than this tangent and everything to the right of this up to this point is more vertical. Right? Therefore, this is an appropriate digital portion and this is an appropriate analog portion. The same thing applies here. Everything to the right of this has a gain less than 1, everything to the left of this point up to this point has a gain greater than 1 and therefore, these two are the natural points. What are these two points? Where dv0 by dvi becomes minus 1. These define the definition of logic. Okay? So, therefore, this point is the input low. Anything under this point will be taken as a low right? because the output will hardly change in that region, only this much change for this whole range of input. Right? Similarly, this point is the input high. For this entire range up to VDD, the output hardly changes. Right? So, this is very important to bring why, how do we define these logic levels? Right? And these logic levels in case of CMOS become power supply dependent. Okay? They are defined in terms of power supply. Whereas, in case of TTL, the power supply is kept constant and therefore, the levels are absolute. Whereas, for CMOS, the levels are power supply dependent. All right. So, now we know how this input high, output high, uh, etc. come. Now, these are the range. First is, let us see what happens if this is the circuit. right? Let us see what happens if this voltage is less than the n channel Vt. So, in this case, what will happen? This, dev this device is off, completely off. It is drawing zero current. Right? Then, this guy sees a very high negative voltage. Its source is at VDD and the gate is at a low voltage. So, it sees a high negative voltage. As a result, this transistor is on and this one is off. Okay? So, as a result, this node through this transistor is connected to VDD. So, therefore, as I change my input voltage from 0 to the VT of n channel, what happens? Well, that is why we had written down these equations. For VGS less than VT, IDS is just 0. Right? So, nothing changes during that range. The IDS of the n channel transistor remains 0. Right? So, therefore, whatever current the upper transistor can provide, since nothing is pulling it down, this voltage will remain at VDD. So, that is one range. 
right and as a result this is that range the output remains essentially at VDD till I reach VTN. However, input law is not VTN even beyond that there is a small region which will which can be taken as low. So, what happens at that time? That means the input voltage has now just got gone just higher than VTN. Therefore, this guy takes away a little bit of current, but still the current provided by this is much higher than the current provided by this, right? And as a result, the output is still low. Okay, so that is the next regime. The NMOS, remember, output is high at this at this up to this point, the output is high. Right? So, the NMOS is saturated because its drain source voltage is high. Whereas the PMOS is in linear regime because there is very little drain source voltage available to the PMOS. This is the PMOS, this output is high. Right? So, there is very little drain source voltage available to this. So, this is in linear regime and this is in saturation. That is one regime. Then, as I still increase the input voltage, both of them get saturated and that is this regime, the linear regime in which both are saturated. Indeed, when we do linear design, our attempts most of the time is to keep all transistors saturated at all times. Okay? So, this is that linear regime and then finally, the opposite. Now, the output has come very low, therefore, NMOS becomes linear and PMOS is now saturated and finally, as I increase the input voltage high, this P, P channel transistor does not even see its VT in the negative direction, turns off. As a result, this transistor is off, this transistor is on and the output becomes 0 and remains at 0 for all voltages afterwards. Okay? So, that qualitatively explains this curve. Okay? So, these are, it is important to split it off into all these uh, regions. Now, the important point is, where are those 45 degree tangents? In which regime? are these 45 degree tangents. Okay? Notice that it cannot be in this regime because in this regime because the lower transistor is not drawing any current the output voltage cannot change it will remain just at VDD therefore the slope has to be 0 there. So therefore if the output has already started to decrease that means the lower transistor has started drawing some current right? and therefore it has to be in this range N MOS saturated P MOS linear. Similarly, this other tangent will occur when NMOS is linear and PMOS is saturated. This will be important when we calculate the noise margin slate. Okay? So, this part is clear. So, what are the concepts that we want to get? First of all, the essence of digital design, the insensitivity to the input voltage. Okay? The second thing is the delineation of digital mode of operation from analog mode of operation and setting up a quantitative condition from which we will be able to derive the input low and input high and output low and output high. Okay? Because once we have said that the tangent at that particular point should be 0, then we can just take the derivative, put it equal to 0 and solve. That will give us the input voltage, output voltage, etc. Et so, that will that way given any technology and any mode of operation, as long as we can express the output voltage as a function of input voltage, we take it, take the derivative of the output voltage with respect to input voltage, set that equal to 0. And that will give you two solutions which will then give you these four points. Okay? So, that is the concept which must be uh, explained. Apart from the actual derivations and so on, they are important particularly for students they will be important. But this concept is very important to explain. Okay? Now, there are a series of uh, slides here which describe the operation in each one of these operations and I will go a little fast because the whole purpose of this lecture is not to do the algebra here. The algebra is available to you as notes as well as in lectures, but the idea is to understand the concepts here. So, first the N channel transistor is off for if the input is less than VTN, P channel transistor is on, output voltage is VDD, this is the normal digital operation range with input equal to 0 and output equal to 1. Next, the NMOS saturated is PMOS linear, both transistors are on. The NMOS is not particularly on because the input has just gone above VT. So, it is pulling a little bit of current, not fully on. Okay? So, this is small enough so that the N channel transistor is in saturation, the P channel transistor is in linear. Okay? 
Now in this case, what do we do? How do we solve? What you do is that remember those old equations that we had. So we put down the current for the n channel transistor and at this time the output voltage is high. So we put down the saturation mode equation for this and the linear mode equation for this and equate the two currents right because that will give the settling voltage here when I equate the two currents and now if I solve okay so the ID this is for the P channel the P channel is in linear right so what is the gate source voltage what is the gate source voltage of the P channel transistor this is this is the source right so this is VDD minus VI absolute value right that is the voltage which is applied between gate and source of the P channel transistor from which I should subtract the VTP right so that is the effective gate source voltage right so that is what we have done here VDD minus VI this is the absolute value actually it is VI minus VDD negative and minus VTP we are taking the absolute value of VTP here right so this is the total amount of forward bias so to speak on the P channel and its drain source voltage is VDD minus V0 right it is important to show how it is VDD minus V0 this is the source this is the drain and therefore the voltage is VDD minus V0 right so the drain source voltage is VDD minus V0 so in that equation we just put VDD minus VI minus VTP for VGS and VDD minus V0 for the drain voltage and then this is the current equation okay the n channel is quite simple because it is saturated so you get kn by 2 vi minus vtn n channel okay and you equate these two okay now there is some algebra it is all done step by step nothing is left to chance okay so we will not just go through deriving you know the standard quadratic equation solving b square minus 4ac and plus minus a and all of that will come okay you can do it at your leisure later but eventually you have an equation for v0 in terms of vi okay so that minus b plus minus root b square minus 4 ac by 2 okay and this says over what regime is this valid because this is valid only when the n channel is saturated and the p channel is linear that puts a limit on the input voltages for which this solution is valid okay next n mos saturated and p mos saturated okay this is a toughie why is it tough because the current is independent of the drain voltage right so then how will you find this voltage equating currents does not involve this voltage at all right so when you equate these two currents the drain current drain voltage of the two transistors does not take part in those equations at all so there is no way that you can determine the drain voltage however you can determine the gate voltage and it turns out that there is a unique solution for the gate voltage and what it means is that there is a gate voltage here at which the drain voltage is undefined whatever the drain voltage in that range where both are saturated there is a solution that means there is a vertical part to this line when you are using the simpler model when you use the more complex model then you will be able to solve for drain because now the current is dependent on drain voltage and then you can get a, an inclined equation here all right so this is that voltage input voltage when input voltage is this much then the output will go go through a transition right for this for this range of voltages and there will be a vertical line there and finally n mos linear p mos saturated and etc etc n mos on p mos off okay so now you give me a regime and i'll tell you what function output voltage is of the input okay and i have also told you for what input voltage range those equations will apply okay now we define noise margins so for robust design the output levels must be interpreted correctly at the input stage of the next stage even in the presence of noise so if you want something to be low it should still be interpreted as low if you add some noise to it 
okay therefore my output voltage must be lower than necessary so that even with the addition of noise it is interpreted as low similarly my output high should be higher than necessary because even with a negative noise spike it should still be considered high by the next stage so as a result the output high must be higher than input high and output low must be lower than the input low and the amount by which this safety factor comes in that is the static noise margin of this uh, family so that we can now easily calculate because we have v output in function in, as a function of vi you choose those points at which the slope is zero and get those four points and the difference between v output high and v input high and the v input low and output v output low that gives you the noise margin okay so that can be easily done again it involves a bit of algebra okay this algebra is a teachers delight because it allows you to set questions set question papers ask them to solve etc etc so uh, you can you can say what is the noise margin if i operate a cmos device with k prime equal to this vt equal to this right so you you can find out depending on uh, the toughness of the question paper that you want to set but concept wise those are the concepts which are important and that is what we are we are doing where db0 by dbi you know uh, is minus 1 those are the two points that we select okay so that's how we calculate the noise margins just use the appropriate equation put db0 by dbi equal to minus 1 and solve and you get these nice symmetrical looking equations okay they always involve that 1 by 8 factor so and they are functions both of vdd vtn and vtp by the way this is a place where one should pause and tell the students that this implies that digital logic will work properly only if vdd is greater than vtn plus vtp otherwise you will have no noise margin left okay because you are subtracting vdd minus vtn minus vtp and this term occurs all over the place vdd vdd minus vtn minus vtp so therefore it is assumed that it is positive so the stage it it tells you why you re, what what puts the minimum limit on the vdd that you should use okay similarly you calculate input high input low and then calculate the noise margins and you get these nice figures okay up to now we have looked only at static characteristics right there was no capacitor there was no cdb by dt and so on of course but it is important to know whether not only that your logic gives you the correct logic functions but it is important that it works fast enough and is designed to be fast enough so you must now do the dynamic characteristics so in dynamic characteristics what we do is that we assume that one of the transistors is off okay so we are not in that close to noise margin region you just assume that one of the transistors is well and truly off in that case for charge up what happens this is at some input low right so the n channel has been turned off and therefore this is the circuit that we must solve for okay and now the drain voltage is no more a constant output voltage is no more a constant it's a function of time okay so the ip that is cdv by dt right so you separate the variables dt by c equal to dv0 by ip okay there is no transistor characteristics on this side and there is no time on this side okay so you separate separated the variables you can integrate these two equations independently so when you integrate what you get is the rise time divided by c is the integral of this from 0 to v output high okay and that tells you what is the charge time yeah uh, one question sir uh you said uh, you're going to assume that only one transistor is on the you're not going to consider the other transistor but won't the rise time also depend on the you know the input signal if it's got a slow input uh, rise time if the input signal itself has got a slow input uh, rise time or fault time will it not affect the you know it, output it will but that is the way to find out the overall delay of concatenated gates i am assuming that this is the delay for an ideally driven input okay so that delay actually goes to the account of the previous stage we are assuming that our delay starts from the point that the input has already reached this value 
So it doesn't matter whether it was sharp or uh, slow. So that is the delay of the previous stage, right? And how to optimize the delay of multiple stages? That is very important, of course, and that is the subject matter of Professor Chandrakar's lecture, which will immediately follow this. Okay? So there is a logical effort, theory of logical effort, which allows you to optimize. Okay? For example, suppose you want an inverting function and you have a large capacitance to drive where the dynamic considerations are very important. Is it better to put one fat inverters or is it better to put three inverters? Okay? That optimization is very important. That includes the points that you are making and that is what logical effort defines which is what Professor Chandra will be discussing. Okay. So once we have this, then of course I know what function IDP is of the voltages. So now I get an equation which is in voltage. I can carry out this integration. By the way, none of the textbooks for some reason actually do this integration. Okay, They just make some very unsatisfactory approximation saying take the average current or whatever, whereas it is actually trivial to do, very easy to do. Okay, And it gives you a very good... Uh, um, in uh, you know field because when you plot it then you see exactly how the output is uh, rising and finally what you find is that the rise time is logarithmic in this notice there are two terms here one is linear the other is logarithmic okay and that is very nice because that is what you see initially when the transistor is saturated it's constant current charging when the upper transistor is saturated, it is constant current char charging and that is this linear term. But once it reaches the linear regime, it is like an RC and then it is exponential charging, therefore the time is logarithmic. Okay? So this relationship can be brought out, otherwise this is a dry algebra. But once this qualitative dependence is made clear to the students, they appreciate that then by choosing different transistors, this term can be made more important or less important by biasing conditions and so on. And obviously, this is linear, this is fast charging. In this point, it, it is already shouldering off, being logarithmic. right? So, these things should be made clear rather than just writing down the expression for it. Okay? So, the first term is the constant current charging. The second term represents the charging by PMOS in the linear range. So, it is like a resistor charging. Okay? And if you just write down the equation for, suppose the P mouse was replaced by a resistor, then this is the expression that you would have got. Okay? So you can make an equation and see what is the equivalent resistance of the P channel in the linear um, rise time. Similarly, you can calculate the fall time. Okay? I am not going to drag you through this whole thing, but it follows very similarly. And not surprisingly, this also has a linear term and a logarithmic term. Okay? So this is when the N channel transistor is saturated, it is pulling a constant current out of the capacitor. As a result, the voltage is going down linearly. But when the vo once the voltage becomes low enough, this transistor is now in the linear regime. Therefore, it looks more like a resistor and therefore, it is not surprising that in this regime, you get a logarithmic. Now, notice that while this is very nice, it is not necessary that the transistor will enter this regime at all. Suppose your input high and output low are so defined that the output low is already reached when you are in the linear regime, then this term won't be there at all. Right? Because this says that after it has reached a zero, how it continues to discharge. But that may not be of interest to you. Right? So therefore, you should be careful about what are the definitions of input high, output low and then uh, up, apply these two terms. Okay? So now we can bring out the conceptual part of this. Having done all this algebra, uh, I think you should have a tutorial for your students in which they actually calculate these numbers. The advantage is that then they become familiar with the orders of magnitudes of these uh, numbers, what are reasonable values, what are unreasonable values, etc. If they have made a mistake in units, what sort of unreasonable values should they start? So, therefore, it is important that they practice this with actual numbers. And then finally, these are the simple expressions that we had gone got for the noise margins. So, it, from here, you notice that noise margin is good if VDD minus this is high. That means, noise margin is good if supply voltage is high. 
but on the other hand power dissipation is more if the noise uh, if, if VDD is high. So, there is a trade off between power speed and robustness higher the value of VDD you would notice that charge time discharge time also had VDD there. So, higher the value of VDD faster is the charging and more robust is the circuit unfortunately more is the power. So, now you have to take a decision do you want low power or do you want noise immunity or do you want speed and you have to come up with an appropriate compromise between these three to, to set the design parameters of your design okay? and those compromises are immediately clear only when you do it this way. Otherwise, you take average charge, average current, take some average current, this is the charge time. You do not get that internal feel of how these things are interrelated. Okay. So, then how do we design an inverter finally? Now, notice that the load capacitance is the external capacitance plus an internal load itself. The larger the transistor, its own capacitance acts as a load. So, that cannot be always that cannot always be ignored. Okay? So, the load capacitance is this constant external capacitance plus something which is proportional to the transistor sizes. I am assuming that K n by K p, K p is constant. That means, the ratio of n channel to p channel is kept constant. So, if you do that then you could take either that will just change the, the proportionality constant here. So, if you put this value into the charge time discharge time, you find that when self capacitance dominates the load capacitance k by c becomes constant. Okay? What does it mean? It means that if you want a faster circuit, you must use a wider transistor because it will then dump more current and quickly charge or discharge, but that you cannot expect to derive benefit from this indefinitely. Because as you keep making the transistor bigger and bigger, you keep adding to your load. And once this term starts dominating, then the current and capacitance increase in the same ratio. And now you cannot make your inverter any faster. Okay? So, there is a technologically, technological limit. Even if you are willing to spend infinite amounts of power, there is a technological limit to what is the fastest circuit that you can make and that comes from here. Okay? These are the points which are very not, not very clearly written in most textbooks and I think these are the things that you should bring out because that will elicit uh, interest uh, from your students that they are understanding these things. Okay? So, now all right, I have this optimum inverter that I have designed. Does it mean that now I must start from scratch for a NAND gate and NOR gate and everything from scratch? The answer is no. Now, we can just apply thumb rules. For example, you can treat the NMOS as a resistor and if you have two NMOSes in series, then make them twice as wide. If you have three in series, make them three times as wide, so that together these three transistors look like the single transistor of the inverter. Okay? Then this gate will have the same characteristics as the inverter that you had designed. Okay? So, this thumb rule is then very easy to uh, apply. So, this is the formula. You take a logical expression. This logical expression must be in a form that there is a bar on top. Okay? So, do your logical um, manipulations so that you end up with an expression which has a bar on top. Now, you look at all the dots and pluses. For every dot in the expression, you put the corresponding n channel transistors in series and the corresponding p channel transistors in parallel. For every plus in the expression, do the opposite. That means, for every plus put n channel in parallel and p channel in series. Okay? For all series transistors, scale up their W by the number of transistors which have been put in series. Okay? And for devices in parallel, do not change the geometry. Okay? So, this is the formula. We will justify this formula in a minute. And here is an example. So, here is some impressive looking expression some a dot b plus c dot d plus e whole bar. Okay? Suppose you want to implement it in one single stage, you do not have to do it as several logic gates. Suppose I want to do it in one single stage, what will happen? All right? There is a bar on top, so we are happy. 
A dot B. That means put A and B n channels in series. Plus, that means this whole combination is to be put in parallel with something. Put in parallel with what? C dot. Therefore, the C transistor in series with D plus E. That means D and E in parallel. Okay? So, it is just like reading out this logical expression. Wherever you see the dot, put things in series like A dot B here. Whenever you see plus D plus E, put them in parallel. This D plus E in series with C because there is a dot here. Okay? So, that is how the N channels are done. Exactly the opposite is done with the P channel. Okay? So, for example, A dot B means A and B are in parallel. Plus, that means this whole combination is in series with C dot D plus E. Therefore, C is in parallel and D plus E, therefore, D and E are in series. Okay? If you follow, why is this rule required? This ensures that whatever turns the lower thing on will, will guaranteedly turn the upper thing off. Okay? Let us take an example. If A and B are both 1, then what these transistors are doing does not matter. They ensure that the lower part is on. Correct? Because through this path. Right? So, if A and B are both 1, that should ensure that the upper channels are, upper transistors are off. Right? Otherwise, both will be on at the same time. So, what part ensures that if both A and B are 1, the upper transistor will be off? Look at this. If both are 1, then both P channel transistors are off. Right? Because if the input is high, the P channel transistor is off. So, if both are 1, both of these are off. And that ensures that it does not matter what these things are doing. The upper transistor will be off. Okay? Take an opposite and even simpler example. If A is off, then this part B does not matter. Okay? Now, if A is 0, B should not matter. Notice here. If A is 0, that means this is on. And therefore, B does not matter whether it is on or off. It is in parallel. Okay? So, that is where this rule comes from. That CMOS condition that we had put, that at least one of, exactly one of these pull up and pull down should be on at a given time. That is ensured by this complementarity between N and P. Okay? And then, of course, you double everything which is in series and leave the parallel geometries untouched. Why do we do that? Why should we not have? After all, we are talking of resistances, right? So, you are saying that if you put an N channel and an N channel in series, then R and R in series becomes 2R, right? But to get back to R, I should put 2R and 2R in series, right? So, therefore, uh, R by 2 and R by 2 in series, right? So, therefore, I must use an N channel which is twice as wide. But why not apply this to parallel? If I have two transistors in parallel, their resistance is only half. So, can't I afford to make them half as wide, each one of them? Why, why don't I change their geometries and make them smaller if there are two transistors in parallel? The answer is that if there are two transistors in parallel, it is not guaranteed that both signals will be 1. Look at these two transistors, A and B. <coughs> they are in parallel, but it is possible that only A is 0, B is actually 1. In that case, this guy will be off and this guy alone should be able to do whatever the inverter was doing. Right? So, therefore, if they are in parallel, you do not change the geometry. You keep it at the inverter level. If they are in series, then you double the width. Okay? So, that gives us this set of thumb, thumb rules. Okay? We will just go over it once again. Then, we will just be adept at it. For every dot in the expression, put the corresponding N channel transistors in series and the corresponding P channel transistors in parallel. For every plus N in parallel, P in series, you scale the transistor widths by the number of devices put in series and the geometries are left untouched for devices put in parallel. Okay? And now you can convert an inverter design to anything that you want.